In episode three, Kenny's cousins that were supposed to be watching him that night wake up and find out that not only is he gone, but his gun's gone too. So they start searching for him, and it doesn't take long to find him in the woods, passed out, kind of similar to the way Aaron's body was found. The first thing he tells him is, I got Dylan. I killed that son of a bitch. So they know they have to take him down to the police station. But Mare isn't there. She's actually at the coroner's office where they get the breakdown of Aaron's autopsy. She died between midnight and 2 a.m. There's no evidence to suggest he was sexually assaulted. All of the bruises on her body appear like they happened at the same time, either when she was ambushed in the woods or not long after. Aaron is also missing a finger. The coroner thinks that it was severed by a bullet. She sent some fingernail scrapings over to a lab, but she's not confident they're going to find anything from that. And what Mare can't figure out is, if it wasn't a sexual assault, why did they take all of her clothes off? Which, Colin says, well, maybe the person wanted it to look like it was. What Mare is confident of is the fact that she wasn't killed in those woods. A good indication of that is the fact that Aaron's bike is still missing. She rode it out of there and was killed someplace else. But Mare then gets a phone call letting her know that Kenny is turning himself in. The issue is, Kenny thought that he killed Dylan. Hell, I thought he killed Dylan. But he didn't kill Dylan. Dylan's not dead. He's in the hospital where his parents are getting a breakdown of what went on. The doctors have removed the bullet, but they're not sure he's ever going to walk again. So that's a big surprise to Kenny. Mayor goes home that night, and she's busy clipping Drew's toenails. But Drew says that his great-grandmother had mentioned that he might have to go live with his mom, his real mom. And boy, does that piss Mayor off. She rips into her mother telling Drew this because Drew's only four years old and her mom screams back at her that is his mother she's going to get custody whether you like it or not as they're yelling at each other though Lori comes in to let Mare know what she was told the previous night by Jess and the whole story that Jess told Lori was the fact that she saw both Frank and Aaron together twice at Aaron's house after school Frank pulled in the driveway Aaron was in the car and he got out with a bunch of baby stuff so, Mayor, not being the one to wait for things, decides, all right, well, I'll go find out the truth, and walks over to Frank's house, where she interrupts game night. You don't interrupt Frank's game night. Everybody knows that, but Mayor, she don't give a fuck. She storms in there saying, you lied to me about knowing Aaron. You did know her. And that gets Frank's attention. So they go out to the porch, but everybody in the house can hear this, including Siobhan, who at this point has joined the conversation, even though Mayor doesn't want her to. And Frank admits, yes, I did help Aaron out. I felt bad for her. She confided in me. It was after Kevin died. But no, I never had sex with her. And when Mayor asks him, will you take a paternity test? He's a little shocked, but he says, yeah, I'll take your test. Bring the people right now. I'm not afraid of their test, just like I'm not afraid to talk about our son. And that line gets Mayor to turn around and walk back home. But even though Frank is saying that he's not the father, they do need to find out if Dylan is the father. So Mayor goes to visit Dylan's parents in the hospital the next day because Dylan is still passed out. And she explains the rumor that's circulating and asks if they could get a DNA sample from Dylan. She explains how it really could help his case and they agree to talk to him. When she gets back to the station, she's informed that both Frank and his fiance are there. Frank has decided to give a statement to Colin. He explains how he had an alibi with Lori's husband that night he drove him home. He once again reiterates he never had sex with Aaron. And it is really awkward for Mare when they head out of there. But Mare did get some good news. She got the phone records that night from Aaron. And the last phone call she made was right after the fight in the woods. And it was to the deacon. The same guy who told Mare's cousin, yeah, I don't really keep up with her as much as we should. Well, I guess he lied. So both Mare and Colin head on over there. And Mare introduces Colin to her cousin. But her cousin lets them know that the deacon is over in the church. So they head over. And question him right there, figuring that it might be tougher for him to lie if he's actually in a church. They record the conversation. He explains how he makes himself available to all of the kids in the parish youth group. Because they think it's a little weird that a 16-year-old girl with a family and friends would decide to call a deacon. He does admit he's not used to getting phone calls, though, at 11 o'clock at night. And he could tell that she was crying and upset. But he really didn't get any specifics. When they ask him where he was that night, he says he was at the rectory all night. He gives a whole religious spiel about how he's Christ's vessel. I went through 13 years of Catholic school. It was tough for me to follow it. And it was definitely hard for Mayor and Colin to follow it because they said, let's be clear, was it you on the phone or was it Christ himself? Even though it's a rhetorical question, he answers, that was me, detective. They then ask him if she said where she was going, but he says no. Mayor makes an offhanded comment that it's weird that he never told the police that she called him the night that she was murdered. She finishes the questioning by saying, what was the last thing you said to her? And Deacon Mark says, I told her that she was loved and God bless. He then goes to walk them out, but she says, uh, can we get your cell phone? I mean, we could get a warrant for it or you could just save us the trip. 
and he hands it over. But he doesn't seem real comfortable in doing so. So Mare heads back to the station, but that night, she's focused on one thing, Richard, because she's got a date, and her mom is thrilled that she's moving on with her life. And when Richard comes to pick her up, he gets introduced to Mare's mom, to which he kisses ass saying, I see where she got the beauty from. You're putting it on a little thick, Rich. But they head off to a fancy restaurant, and you can tell it's fancy because they have wine barrels in the background and all the wall is stone. Richard did not take her to an olive garden. Mary explains her home dynamic that her mom moved in after Kevin killed himself to help take care of Drew. She goes on to explain how Drew's real mom, who's in and out of rehab, is trying to get full custody of him. And Richard can commiserate because he also has a child that his wife has full custody of. Their relationship kind of fizzled when the book groupies came calling. I mean, waves of librarians and Richard just couldn't say no. But even though his relationship with his ex ended, his relationship with his son currently is pretty good. He gives her a little advice saying you should sit with Drew's mom and tell her that you want to be a part of his life. And if you think you're conceding something, you're not. So it's something for Mare to think about. The next day, though, they get a phone call because a group of kids who were playing football came across Aaron's severed finger. And the location of the finger just so happens to be about 13 miles away from where Aaron left in the woods. Mare and Colin start going over the scenario of how this might have played out. And the fact is, they don't know how many shots were fired. They just know that Aaron was hit by two bullets. So Mare convinces Colin to make a phone call and get all the firearm dogs in the area to that location. Maybe they can find something. And there was only one dog that picked up on something, and Mare is combing over the area, but Colin wants to leave. It's late at night, it's freezing cold, but Mare doesn't give up, and she sees that there is a nick in the roof of one of the buildings. And when she follows it, sure enough, she finds a bullet lodged in a tree. The next day, though, is Saturday, and they're having a big carnival in the area where everybody seems to be in attendance. They all have different roles they're playing. Mayor's mom and Drew are giving out raffle tickets along with Mrs. Carroll. And Mrs. Carroll is convinced that the neighbor behind her house is a little psychopath. And maybe she's onto something because he's like 17 and he's getting his face painted. And he just has that crazy psycho look. Mayor, though, is over on the grill flipping burgers. And she's next to Lori's husband who is pissed off that Mare insinuated Frank had anything to do with the murder. He shows Mare proof that he had taken Frank home that night. Frank passed out drunk. But then shortly after that, Mare looks up and sees Colin waving for her to come over because there was an anonymous tip that came in for them to look into why Deacon Mark was transferred to that church. He asks Mare, did your cousin say anything? And Mare says, no, but then again, I never asked. So they both head over to the church to question him, and he's in the house looking at them from the upstairs window, but he never comes down. The next morning, Mare is awoken early in the morning by Mrs. Carroll. And that's because somebody had spray-painted on her shed, come over and squeeze Betty's titties. And she is very offended by this, even though her husband points out, Betty, those don't even look like yours. Mrs. Carroll is convinced that it's the kid that lives behind them. And Mare asks, well, did you ever get that security camera hooked up? And in fact, they did. And when Mare combs over the footage, she does see the kid doing it. But instead of alerting the Carrolls to it, figuring that it might be a bigger headache for her in the long run, she just deletes the footage and says, no, you never set it up, and leaves. She then goes to meet with Drew's mom. And the conversation starts off civil enough with Mare saying how she doesn't want to move Drew out in the middle of the school year. She would rather have a smooth transition with this. But Carrie brings up a good point. You don't really remember anything when you're four years old. If we move him out now, before too long, he'll just think that I was always in his life. Mary tries to bring up her concerns over Drew's tics, but Carrie kind of snaps at her saying, I don't care about any of that. So that's when Mare gets tough with her, saying, if you want to sit there and try to take custody of Drew, that's fine but I'll fight you on it, and I'll tell the judge that you're an unfit mother who has psychotic breakdowns, someone who sees ghosts in the trees and talks to people. Carrie yells at her how she hasn't had an episode in 16 months, and then cuts to Mare's core telling her, you know, Kevin hated you, and he would hate knowing the fact that you were raising his son. So I'm going to get custody, not just for me, but I'm going to get custody for Kevin too, because Drew deserves better than you. When Mare gets to work the next day, Colin lets her know that other than Aaron's dad, nobody else has registered firearms. So as far as suspects go, they're looking at a family member or an intimate partner. They start going over some of the suspects, but nobody really makes a ton of sense. Colin asks if Mare ran Deacon Mark's cell phone, and she says, yeah, but there was nothing real significant. A few texts between him and Aaron around the time she had the baby, but that's it. Colin asks her if she wants to take another run at him, but she says, no, not yet. We'll probably only get one more chance at him, because once the diocese knows that we're sniffing around, they're going to lawyer up. 
there's a little bit of a lull in the conversation. And Mayor asks Colin, how did he crack that 10-year-old cold case? And Colin says how he just got so immersed in the case that he just kept interviewing the same people over and over again until somebody's stories changed and he got a lead. Unfortunately, with that case, the girl was found dead, and it still sits with Colin, you can tell. After Colin leaves, though, the whole situation with Carrie is still eating at Mare, so she decides to try to do something about it. Going into the evidence room and stealing two bags of heroin. She heads to the bar that night with the heroin in her pocket, and up walks Colin, shit-faced, because that night was his 15-year high school reunion. And it's been a little rough for him, because his almost ex-wife showed up, girl that he was proposed to that broke it off with him two weeks before the wedding. And he's drunkenly confiding in Mare that he's getting to that age where you thought you'd be isn't anywhere near where you actually are. He then drunkenly apologizes for what happened to Kevin, saying, I bet you were a good mother, but Mare says no. No, I wasn't. Colin's high school buddies then yell for him to come over and take some shots, and Mary says, no, go have fun with your friends. And Colin actually says, I don't know if I want to go back with them. I think I want to stay here with you. And gives that drunken smile of like, hey, maybe we can hook up. But Mary shoots him that look of no effing chance, and Colin walks away. But as these two were at the bar, one of their suspects was getting rid of evidence. Because Deacon Mark went to a bridge, took out Aaron's bicycle, and chucked it over into the river. The next morning, though, Mare is awoken to a knock at the door, and it's Chief Carter. Because it turns out that Carrie was pulled over with two bags of heroin in her car, and she said that it wasn't hers, claiming that it was Mare who must have planted it. Mare tries to play it off like, well, Carrie's a drug addict, she'll say anything, and Carter admits, yeah, that's what I thought too, until I saw the bags of heroin, and I recognized them from a case two years ago. And then when I went to evidence... It turns out that somebody had taken two bags out and changed the log. And Mare tries to lie, saying, well, you think that's me? And Carter shoots back, I know it was you. So here's how this is going to play out. I'm placing you on administrative leave. The story is that you're overworked and these two cases are taking a toll. On top of that, you're still struggling to deal with the fact that your son killed himself. I recommended grief counseling and you agreed to it. Mare is fighting him on it all the way, but he says, I'm doing you a favor because I know what you've been through. Mare then has to go into her house, grab her badge and her gun and hand it over to him. And right before he leaves, he says, if it crosses your mind to go ahead with the Aaron McMinniman case, don't do it. Now, real quick, I do want to give an update on Dylan. He was told when he woke up by his parents that his son might not be his, and that really upsets Dylan. But it seems like he is going to give a DNA sample. And then with Siobhan, her band had a live performance on a college radio station. Right before they were going to perform, Siobhan's girlfriend is high as a kite on edibles. I mean, she is gone, and it really pisses off Siobhan. But the band plays on, and the DJ who invited them over is hitting on Siobhan pretty hard, inviting her to a concert and admitting, yeah, I'm inviting you on a date. At first, Siobhan says no, but Siobhan's in an emotional state. She's doing a project for school where she's making a video all about her brother's suicide. So she goes back to the college and takes the girl up on her offer to go to the concert with her. Thanks for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to this channel. Like the video if you liked it. Hit thumbs down if you don't. Be nice in the comments section. Nasty comments hurt my feelings. I work hard on these. If I make a mistake, it happens. If you don't see the next video up in the end screen, it'll be up soon. Sharing is caring. Put it on your MySpace page or your away message. And check out my podcast, Scene Invaders, wherever you listen to podcasts.